This is the reason why financial advisors don't need to get into real estate with their expertise. If they don't understand that real estate is an entirely different entity. You've got maintenance, you've got risk, you've got tenant factors, you've got natural disasters, you've got a lot of things that you got to factor in that's not mathematical. Some of it is just Murphy's Law in action. And you'll see a lot of these financial advisors that get into real estate because on YouTube, it's cool to talk about it. You'll see a lot of people that don't do real estate deals and know there's litigation problems, there's insurance problems, there's things, termites, there's a, a, the homeless guy that just lit fire to the back shit. So I want to have a very frank conversation this morning. I got my coffee and I want to give a little advice to the home owners out there. You're looking to sell. You're looking to stay put. What should you do? I'm going to give you my opinion. And this is all my opinion as a real estate investor, somebody that's made a million dollars in real estate and selling real estate. And on this YouTube channel, I'm going to give you my opinion. I'm going to be very frank and I'm going to split this up into really three parts. If you have a mortgage and it's two to let's say 5%, 5% to today's rates, let's say 7%. And then if you have it paid off, my house is paid off. Okay. And I'm going to give you my thoughts. I've been seeing a lot of financial advisors out there talking about this and financial advisors look at things differently than real estate investors. Real estate investors look at things different than real estate agents. And I've been all of them, okay? I haven't been a financial advisor. I just don't agree with those guys. I've made my own money. I've saved my own money. I bought big things and I flipped them and I've made a lot of money. So I'm gonna give you my opinion as somebody that's got money and what maybe you should do. So let's get right to it. So the poison pill of our economy has been the 2% mortgage that the federal government and their great great intelligence gave the American public. They were trying to fight the you-know-what pandemic and uh, it created its own problem. Accelerated housing, housing prices going up, 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 and they didn't really know how to catch it. Trust me, I sold houses during that period. I owned houses during that period. I think I had six houses, five houses during that period, and it was crazy. Nobody knew what was going on, what was going to happen, but now we have seen what happened and prices in some places went up 50%, 100%. It's nuts. Uh, my house my here in Navy Point, I bought for $60,000. Okay. It's worth probably $400,000 now. It's absolutely crazy. So if you have that three to 4%, two to three, two to 4% interest rate, well, congratulations. Your interest rate is probably below true inflation. And uh, that is pretty cool. If you're gonna lose your 2%, 3% rate and then pay up for the next one and have to get a five to 7% rate, well, get tomatoes, tomatoes, okay? And that's why I have harped, pay down your mortgage, pay down your mortgage, don't have debt, don't have debt. And I'll talk about why in this video. But you're going to get into a few different situations. One, let's say you do have to move. Uh, nobody really stays in the same place for 40 years. Few do, and that's great. I would just pay it off and be done with it. But there is a difference between mathematical finance, peace of mind formula, and building wealth. Okay, And I'm going to talk about that throughout this video. That 2%, 2 to 4% interest rate is cool until your insurance goes up, okay? I've got a lot of real estate investor buddies that got these mortgages and they were all bragging to me about their interest rate, their interest rate, and then their insurance tripled, okay? Because one, insurance companies wanna keep up with the price point of the property or whatever your premium is. Two, the house is gonna wind up having repairs, it's gonna need roofs, it's gonna need updated four points and the insurance company is going to find a way to squeeze you. So eventually if you're renting them out and you're trying to be a landlord, the cash flow is going to get squeezed on them and you some in most cases the interest rate is the only reason why you are cash flowing. So you got to keep an idea on that and being a distant landlord is one of those things I've talked about in a lot of my videos. If you don't have a lot of skill being a landlord, it can be very tough. Uh, one busted pipe that floods the interior of your house or one tenant leaving the water on or one hurricane or one uh, snowstorm or tornado or whatever that 
you didn't have covered properly an insurance short-term uh, rentals and you didn't have the right insurance policy, they trash the house or a slip and fall claim and the insurance doesn't want to cover you because you lied to the insurance company and that two to four percent interest rate goes right out the window. If you're a homeowner and you're living in it and you don't want to go anywhere, great, keep it. But I will tell you this, and I'll talk about this later in the video, it is absolutely very hard to retire, actually retire with a mortgage. Because why? Get sick, can't pay the mortgage. Let's say you miss two or three uh, in, uh, <laughs> payments and it is no longer your house. That is the risk delta of not having a paid for house. I'm gonna talk about that throughout this video. I'm gonna add to this, elder care. If you have not planned for that and you have a crazy medical bill, spend three weeks in acute care, ICU, and voila, your medical bill is gonna be a million bucks. And you do not have your house paid for, does not have homestead exemption. Many states, it'll protect you. That money paid for, house stays. But let's say you kept that mortgage and now you've got a million dollar uh, judgment coming at you. Uh, congratulations, you're now homeless, okay? Because they're going to take all the money out of your bank account and you're going to be barely surviving this onslaught, okay? But if your money is in your house, most likely in some states, you're going to be able to keep that property, that equity in your house, which is paid for. And uh, it is terrible when you're on a fixed income and you're older and then now all of a sudden that mortgage is taking half of your fixed income. That is not where you want to be. And uh, now your insurance is going to be higher and your property tax is going to be higher probably when you get there. Just keep the stuff in mind. I would say if you got that that uh, interest rate, I would at least get rid of the PMI. I would pay that down. I would try to get to the 50% hash mark of the policy or the, of the mortgage and work out from there. I'll say that the same thing for the five to seven. Look, five to seven percent interest is brutal. I have a, a, a mortgage that a house that I owner finance to somebody at eight percent. Very tough for them to catch that mortgage. Okay, very tough to catch it at seven, and it is very hard to have a cash flow and property rental property at five to seven. It will eat you up. One percent rule does not work at five to seven. Five to seven percent. If you're carrying proper insurance and your taxes fluctuate at all. Um, just keep that in mind and uh, I would I would definitely pay down the five to seven percent interest rate look I want to I be very 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 blunt with this if you are saying well I can get the difference of the interest rate and the stock market versus paying down my mortgage you miss the risk factor the delta of risk and as a real estate investor, as a real estate agent, as a person that's seen properties go south, who has invested their own money and lost lots of money, the risk factor of the stock market, you don't know if you're going to be an up year, year. You don't know if you're factoring in true inflation to those numbers. I don't care what your modulars were from your financial advisor. Factoring in the true rate of inflation in the S&P 500, many people think that it's barely above break even on the S&P 500 just because that's the high tide water line of inflation. I will stand and die on that hill, okay? You've got crazy accounting formulas. You don't know what the tax uh, variabilities are gonna be in the future, especially if it's a retirement account. So you know by paying down your interest rate, you are getting a true true rate of return. If it's 2%, you're getting 2%. If it's 5%, you're getting 5%. And the tax deduction myth, okay, you're barely going to be breaking breaking the watermark with getting your tax deduction on your interest rate unless maybe you're doing it as an investment and you're able to write off that, that tax uh, deduction for interest, for mortgage interest. Most people don't file their taxes properly. Most people don't use uh, the right depreciation schedules on their properties. Most people don't know how to do it on their personal property and they wind up losing that deduction and odds are if you were actually audited, you would probably not be able to hold it up. I'm just being honest with it with you. So to keep things simple, you just pay down your debts and you know you're getting a true rate of return. And if you think you're gonna get that margin in the stock market, yeah, the rate of return was 8%, as they would say. You factor in true inflation, taxes, risk delta, you're not getting 8%. On average, across the board, after you pay all that stuff, you're not getting the rate of return you 
thought you were going to be and you're also having the risk of losing money in the stock market so just keep that in mind it's the same way when i go buy a property and i rent it out i know you're gonna have vacancy rate i'm gonna have a vacancy rate i'm gonna have maintenance i'm gonna have that wow factor of some type of natural occurrence that's just going a tree falling something's going to happen to the property over 20 or 30 years that's factored in there's a lot of things appliances going out the ice maker getting a leak on the back of it and flooding the floors all these things happen slip and fall claims my own time going to and from properties you got to think about these things calling roofers calling maintenance people it's just the same as in the stock market. There's always a delta of risk in all this. Real estate people have a higher knack of taking risk. I have a higher knack of taking risk, but it's all calculated. I'm, I'm going two up, one down. I'm, I'm trying to hedge my downside. I'm trying to buy the property right because every dollar in real estate is made on the buy. It's usually not made on the sell unless you're really good at beating out equity on the far side. So if you're thinking about, I need liquidity and I do stuff with my cash, therefore I need more cash and I don't want to pay down my mortgage, cool, do that. I'm kind of one of those kind too, but I think the misnomer in that, I've talked about this on a lot of videos, is you're buying too much house, okay? If you're, if you're qualified for X, that's probably the high end of what theoretically you should buy. That is saying this is your threshold of pain from the mortgage lender. That does not mean you got to buy that much house. You could buy something a lot cheaper. And for me, I bought a property that I could renovate. I could build out equity. Yeah, I bought it for 60. It was probably worth 150 and then the market took it the rest of the way. But I was able to beat out the extra equity. A lot of people just buy an $800,000 house because that's what they were uh, told they could get. They get it. And then all their cash goes into it. And when they pay it off, they got an $800,000 stationary piece of something in the ground. Yeah, it, it is a quasi asset slash, slash liability because you're spending money on it. And you're probably saying I'm never going to move out of it. And you put a lot of cash in it. Whereas me, I bought a, an average price house and I took my extra cash and I invested it in real estate and I just kept building and building, building and building businesses and building and building and building. And I had that free free, free flow of cash. So having you know, liquidity is, is something that a lot of people don't wanna talk about in finance. You gotta have cash to make money most of the time. So don't spend it all on a house and be house poor. That's just uh, my thought on that. Be cognitive of insurance and maintenance. You're going to have to work on that house over the 30 years. If you own it, probably more than five years, things are gonna break. Over 10 years, you're gonna be doing AC units, you're gonna be doing roofs, you're gonna be doing appliances, you're gonna be doing some type of plumbing and electrical. It's gonna happen. And if you own it over 20, well, odds are you're gonna do everything. 30, you're gonna be replacing the duckings and, and uh, ducks in the air, uh, handlers and the whole nine yards, okay? If you own it, even more than that, plumbing, whole, you're gonna be redoing everything. Flooring, counters, cabinets. So just keep that in mind uh, when you're thinking about a property. Yeah, you're, you're paying this much for it, but you're gonna have a lot of renovation. It's gonna be a dollar per square foot per year cost of maintenance on that property. Okay, keep that in mind. This is the reason why financial advisors don't need to get into real estate with their expertise. If they don't understand that real estate is an entirely different entity. You've got maintenance, you've got risk, you've got tenant factors, you've got natural disasters. You got a lot of things that you got to factor in that's not mathematical. Some of it is just Murphy's Law in action. And you'll see a lot of these financial advisors that get into real estate because on YouTube, it's cool to talk about it. You'll see a lot of people that don't do real estate deals and know there's litigation problems, there's insurance problems, there's things, termites, there's uh, the homeless guy that just lit fire to the back shit. There's those things. There's contractual problems. There's all kinds of stuff that cannot be quantified in a little formula that they put on their Excel spreadsheet. And I have a good buddy that is a, a premier financial advisor. And me and him get a case of beer and we throw stuff back and forth all day long. And we'll get in almost a fist fight. He's a big guy too. We'll get in almost a fist fight over some of these things because a financial advisor looks at it one way and a real estate investor looks at it a totally different way. And I'll give you his number, you can call him and he'll tell you that, that me and Jack 
go head to head on most of these things because we look at them totally different and some things can't be quantified. For those five to 7% mortgages out there, heck, just get into the property and try to refi later. I know not everybody has the money to actually pay cash for a house and these are just the things that uh, you're having to do right now, but I do believe into the next year, probably mid next year, you're gonna see interest rates that are manageable. I bet you see five to six percent, four and a half to five point five. Because look, the United States government cannot keep paying uh, these high Fed funds rates. Like they just can't. Things are already starting to crack, and they're already talking about bringing them back down because the Fed knows that pain's coming. And, and these politicians, they need their entitlement programs. They need free flow and money. They need the money printer to keep going. And that's what they do with these low interest rates. There's, there's a weird number. I've talked about it in a lot of videos that five, above 5.5% Fed funds, like the, the cracks start happening in our economy. So they don't want that. They don't want the fallout. They don't want that, especially in an election year. Uh, probably after elections, well, all the game's off. The mitts are coming off. So just keep that in mind. And to talk to those with no mortgage. No mortgage is a great place. The peace of mind is great. I have great peace of mind knowing the only thing I've got to pay for is taxes. And my taxes are kept with a homestead exemption here in the state of Florida. Also, my insurance is uh, fairly manageable. And if they got sideways with me, well, I could tell them to take a hike. I could narrow it down to self-insure. I could just do liability. I could just do liability and fire. I could just do liability and the basic necessities, or I could just do liability. There's a lot of options and I don't have to worry about insurance company or the mortgage company forcing insurance on me and my premium goes for $2,000 a, a month. Well, most of the time it's escrowed for people. And then they force it on me, it's $15,000. What did I say? $2,000 a year, excuse me. And then I, <laughs> I uh, get forced on me and now it's $15,000 a year. And, and since people escrow their, their mortgage usually, all of a sudden my, my monthly goes sky high. Um, these are all things. And for me, my financial plan was to pay down debt. I know my real rate of return. It was to have a peaceful mind, stability, and that comes from a paid off house. I was able to accrue uh, a, a major part of, of appreciation in my house. Um, yes, I do have expenses, but I gotta live somewhere. I do have, you know, you call liabilities with the property, but I have to live somewhere. And I bought a fairly manageable property that's easy to maintain, and it's been great to me. I've been able to take the rest of my money from then on and invest it wisely and create wealth. And I think that's truly how wealth is created, not by um, all this financial engineering of financing. Look, leverage is a broadsword. It is a double-edged sword that can cut you and, and hurt you, or you can use it to build things. You can use it to build wealth, but you have to play with it very care carefully. And I don't believe in it. I believe in just go make more money, and put that money in other things, okay? And the true wealthy people, I don't care what the TikTokers say, on things that are manageable uh, amounts of money, they just pay cash for it. And they're not gonna waste their brain power thinking about how I'm gonna shave $100 here, or I'm gonna you know, go out there and save X amount. They're gonna walk in, they're gonna pay cash for the thing, they're gonna walk out, and they're gonna go focus their mindset on their business, or on the next deal, or where they can make more money exponentially somewhere else. They're not going to get rich off of that, that $150,000 mortgage. Okay, they're going to buy it cash, they're gonna rent it out, and they're gonna move on to the next thing because they focused where they can leverage their time for money. And whatever you do, do not dodge the right property because you're chasing an interest rate. If you have a location and it meets your housing needs and it's what you need in the right school district and, and has everything you wanted, don't say, ah, I'm not gonna do that because I might get 0.75 better on an interest rate six months from now. That property will not be there. Look, when interest rates start to go down next year, whenever that may be, the price of properties is going to go up. 
real estate will start going up. Inflation has not solved its problem and to reduce rates into a high inflationary environment is downright dangerous. And all of a sudden we're gonna look up and housing prices have jumped another 10%, 15%, and you're gonna find yourself in a very bad situation saying, I should have bought. Talk to a guy this week and he's like, well, what do you think housing's gonna do? I said, I think you're gonna do yourself more of an injustice by staying out of the market than hoping you're gonna get another 10% off or a better interest rate. Because that property you think you're gonna get is not gonna exist. Look, I'll tell you right now, in Navy Point, <laughs> this little house I got right here, this little neighborhood right here on the water, if this interest rates go down another point and a half to 2% like they where they were, there will not be one house for sale in this neighborhood. Like it will all be gone because that everybody knows, <laughs> the savvy real estate guys like me know that when you lower interest rates in an inflationary environment, we've got to hedge ourselves from inflation and we are going to buy everything and we can see. And you don't think these hedge funds are, are already thinking about that? That's where 40% of the last two years uh, uh, volume went. <laughs> To hedge funds okay it went to large llc's and corporations buying up properties they're hedging themselves and we will wind up being in a renter nation for the exact same thing i've been talking about on this video <laughs> it is setting the standard for a renter nation and now nar has is going to collapse and the real estate agent is the only real thing that was stepping in the way of these hedge funds coming up and buying entire blocks because we kind of put the mittens and kept them away and put the price points where they should be, where they couldn't take advantage of people. There is a reason, and I'm gonna go on a tangent here, there is a reason why most acquisitions officers in these large uh, home builders and corporations that are buying these properties and buying this land don't have real estate licenses. So they can do crummy things. A lot of them do very shady stuff. I've been in deals with them and they will not have a real estate license. They'll, they'll tell, like they've told me, nobody on our staff has a real estate license because we don't want to have the fiduciary problems that it comes with. Okay, they don't, they want to take advantage of people and they want to get the right price. And that was the only reason why a lot of people didn't, when they got caught blindsided by prices going up, because I saw a lot of underpriced houses in the last, the first year it happened, even real estate agents were underpriced them and it was crazy but it happens. So lastly, I'm gonna say, being a distant landlord is very hard. So rent versus sell. I honestly, if I lived there two of the last five, I would take that IRS tax code and I would take it tax free. 250,000, I believe, if you're single, 500,000, if you're not, or if you're married and, and filing jointly, you can take that tax free. Take that tax free gain, because when you get tax free gains, you take them and you go to the next deal and you put that somewhere else. If you have to, 1031 exchange it if you're renting it out. But the only way I would keep a rental if I had to take the tax gain, if I could take the tax gain or couldn't take the tax gain, it would be if it was like right next door. Because you're gonna have problems with tenants. Heck, Brant had somebody um, uh, commit suicide in one of his and he had to fly all the way to Missouri and they had to clean it up and it was a mess. Look. Distant landlord is rough. It is rough, 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 rough. Keep that in mind. Uh, I had a conversation with a client this week. I'm like, why do you want to keep that house in Atlanta when you can sell it, take it tax free, come down here and be retired? Okay. Don't worry about that two or three hundred dollar a month cash flow, which one problem could wipe it all out, or vacancy could just wipe it all out, or litigation. And it's just, you, that's just my opinion on that. I believe the real answer is find where your pain infliction point is, split your money up, pay down your mortgage the best you can, do, save for retirement, save up an emergency fund, have some liquidity because that's what happens to people is they go into properties with uh, no liquidity, they don't have any backup, and then all of a sudden the insurance company uh, <laughs> drops you and, and then all of a sudden they demand that you gotta have a roof or windows or electrical wiring, whatever, fix, plumbing, and it's 10, 15, $20,000 and all of a sudden you're caught and you don't know what to do. I talked about that in my last video. You don't wanna be in a position where you don't have the cash to fix the things and then you're looking at foreclosure. All of a sudden they, they force an insurance policy on you that's way more than you expected and now what? And that great two to three percent interest rate, but a forced insurance policy and taxes that are rising, which they're going to go up here when they reassess us all because the price points have moved so much. 
can be very painful. This all can be very painful and you can catch yourself in a foreclosure situation. I'm seeing foreclosure situations all over the place because taxes got them or the insurance is getting them or they just can't afford the maintenance on the house. Uh, or just like with citizens here in the state of Florida, they're gonna force everybody to have flood insurance. And then there's an extra added expense on the property. And uh, you know, you just weren't looking for that. And the property got that much more to own. So just keep these things in mind that having these mortgages come with problems, whatever that rate may be, come with the problems of instability. And you can be without the property very fast. And so I believe paid for houses are the way to go because you can tell that insurance company to take a hike if you want to. And or at least until you fix what you need to be get fixed, you get a cheaper insurance policy and you're not getting railroaded. So in conclusion, a little advice to buyers. I'm gonna do another video, I think after this, to my buyers is, uh, you know, it's slim pickings out there right now. We don't know what the interest rates are gonna do. We don't know if the market's gonna slow down or speed up. And I believe that you find location one and then you bid into it. And if you think that the market is gonna go down 10, 15%, well, just put your bid in 15% under. If you're buying with cash, okay, and that's why I believe in paid for mortgages, paid for houses and cash. When you're buying with cash, you can get that 15, 20% discount usually. You can go in there, you can get some, some straight up uh, uh, contingencies built into this and, and you can get some things because nobody wants to deal with the lenders and the inspections and all these things. You walk in like a boss and you give them a 20% under uh, offer and you demand some things and you say, I can close in 10 days and I don't, I, I got my inspection, we're good, let's roll. I ain't playing with that. And odds are you're gonna get a good deal. And that's how this goes down. And and I mean, heck, you, I mean, you can even probably get a better deal than that on some of these properties, you pick it right, especially around the water. Um, that's, that's really it. I'm gonna do another video on it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and you'll see that video. And comment down below with your thoughts. I just don't believe in all this financial engineering because the bank will get theirs, okay? And if you don't pay them, they're gonna get it. And uh, stuff happens in life. So I'll see you guys later.